The afternoon sun was low, casting long shadows across Oak Street as Mary Williams, a grandmother with a warm heart and a gentle smile, walked hand in hand with her two young grandchildren. The three of them had spent the morning at the local grocery store, filling a basket with all of their favorites fresh strawberries, homemade bread, peanut butter, and boxes of apple juice staples for every visit from her grandkids. Mary's face was peaceful, her wrinkled but radiant skin hinting at years of both quiet resilience and heartfelt laughter. Her grandchildren, 10-year-old Isaiah and 7-year-old Lily, looked up to her with admiration and trust, comforted by her unwavering presence. Isaiah's curiosity got the best of him as he trotted a few steps ahead, pointing excitedly at a small squirrel dashing up a tree, its bushy tail flickering like a little flame. Mary chuckled, her voice a comforting sound that settled like warm honey. That squirrel's working hard to store food for winter, just like we did today, she said, tightening her grip on Lily's hand. The three shared a laugh, enjoying the simplicity of their walk, the familiar streets lined with neighbors' houses, each one with a small garden or a porch adorned with flower pots. They paused by a small flower bed at the corner of the block, where a vibrant patch of marigolds caught Lily's attention. She bent down, taking in the earthy scent. Grandma, can we plant flowers like these at home? She asked, her big brown eyes sparkling with hope. Of course, baby girl Mary replied, brushing a strand of hair from Lily's face. We'll pick out some seeds next time and I'll show you how to take care of them. Flowers need love and patience to grow, just like people do. Isaiah rolled his eyes playfully, but a small grin tugged at his lips. He loved listening to his grandmother's gentle wisdom, even if he pretended not to care. To him, Mary was like one of the tall oak trees lining their neighborhood, a constant, steady presence who always seemed to have the right answers. As they continued walking, a light breeze rustled through the leaves, carrying with it the sounds of the neighborhood, the distant laughter of children playing, a dog barking, and the faint hum of a lawnmower from a yard down the street. Mary felt at peace in these familiar sounds they were the background music of her life, each note a reminder of her place within this community that had become a second family. But as they rounded the corner onto Maple Avenue, a different sound reached them, the sound of an approaching police car. Mary glanced over her shoulder, noticing the flashing blue and red lights. She felt a slight pang of unease, a familiar but subtle twinge in her chest that came with seeing those lights. The police car slowed as it neared them, and a strange tension settled over the scene. Mary tightened her hold on her grandchildren's hands, urging them gently to keep walking. As they drew closer, the car pulled up beside them, and two officers stepped out, their gazes locked on Mary. She recognized one of them, Officer Dale, from around town a tall, broad-shouldered man with a perpetually serious expression. The other officer whom she didn't recognize was younger, with a more rigid posture and an air of unearned authority. Both wore expressions that hinted at suspicion, as though merely seeing Mary and her grandchildren on the street warranted their attention. Ma am Officer Dale called, his voice devoid of warmth. Can I have a word with you? Mary stopped, glancing down at her grandchildren with a reassuring smile before turning to face the officers. Yes, officers, is there something I can help you with? Isaiah and Lily shifted closer to her, instinctively clutching her hands a little tighter. Mary could feel their nervousness and hoped her calm demeanor would reassure them, even as a tight knot began to form in her stomach. We've had some complaints about suspicious activity in the area, Officer Dale said, his gaze sliding over Mary's appearance, her simple dress, worn cardigan, and sensible shoes. There was an unmistakable edge to his tone, one that made Mary feel as though she were being judged, sized up, and found wanting. S. Suspicious activity, Mary asked, keeping her voice even and respectful. She knew better than to give them any reason to escalate the situation. We were just heading home from the store. The younger officer, whose name tag read Travis, crossed his arms, his eyes narrowing as they lingered on Mary's shopping bag. Mind if we take a look in that bag, Ma I am? Mary's breath caught slightly. Her groceries? There was nothing remotely suspicious about a loaf of bread, some peanut butter, and a carton of milk. She opened her mouth to protest but stopped herself, mindful of the children beside her. With a small sigh, she lifted the bag and held it out for them to inspect. It's just grocery, she said gently, her eyes meeting Travis's gaze with a steady calm. We were heading home to make some sandwiches. Officer Dale took the bag from her and rifled through it, 
pulling out each item with exaggerated care, as though he expected to find something incriminating hidden among the groceries. Isaiah and Lily watched in silent confusion, their young faces filled with questions they didn't dare voice. Finally, after inspecting the last item, Dale dropped the bag back into Mary's hands with a slight sneer. Where's your ID, Ma I am? Mary blinked, taken aback. My ID? I. It's in my purse at home, she said, feeling a faint flush of embarrassment. She hadn't thought to bring it, they were only going to the grocery store, after all. Not carrying your ID, ha Officer Travis muttered, his tone carrying a subtle accusation that sent a chill down Mary's spine. Isaiah, sensing his grandmother's discomfort, spoke up, his small voice filled with innocent courage. Why do you need her ID? She didn't do anything wrong. The officers exchanged glances, and a flicker of annoyance passed over Dale's face. You kids need to stay quiet and let the adults handle this, he said curtly, his tone dismissive and harsh. Isaiah's face fell, and Mary squeezed his hand reassuringly. Taking a deep breath, Mary addressed the officers once more. Officers, I don't understand why you're treating us this way. We were simply walking home. Officer Dale's expression hardened. We're just doing our job, my am. You fit the description of someone we're looking for. The words stung, and a thousand thoughts swirled in Mary's mind. What description? She knew this area well she had lived here for decades, watched it grow, and poured herself into the community. To be treated this way, especially in front of her grandchildren, was an insult she hadn't expected. But she kept her composure, her eyes steady as she looked between the officers. May I ask who you're looking for? Then Mary asked, her voice holding a quiet strength. Dale's eyes flashed with irritation, as though her calmness was somehow an affront to him. We're not at liberty to disclose that. Ma I am, he replied. But we're within our rights to ask for your ID and search your belongings. In the tense silence that followed, Mary could feel the weight of her grandchildren's eyes on her, their innocent trust mixed with a growing fear. She wanted to shield them, to protect them from the harsh reality unfolding before them. But she also knew that shielding them completely wouldn't serve them in the long run. They needed to see her strength, to know that even in the face of injustice she wouldn't waver. Look, she said, keeping her voice soft but firm, we've done nothing wrong. If you need to follow up, I can give you my address, and you can come speak to me there. But right now I'd like to take my grandchildren home. The younger officer, Travis, took a step closer, his expression twisting into a scowl. We're not done with you yet, he snapped. You need to understand that when an officer gives you an order, you follow it. Lily whimpered, clutching her grandmother's hand tightly, and Isaiah's face grew stormy with a child's righteous anger. Mary pulled them both close, placing a protective arm around each of them. Her heart pounded in her chest, but she refused to let fear control her. I understand, she replied evenly, but I also know my rights. The tension reached a boiling point as Dale clenched his jaw, clearly frustrated by her calm defiance. He exchanged a look with Travis, and the two of them seemed to reach a silent agreement. Fine, Dale said, stepping forward. We're taking you in for questioning. The words echoed in Mary's ears, her mind reeling with disbelief. Taking me in? For what she asked, a tremor in her voice despite her best efforts to stay composed. For obstructing justice and resisting orders, Travis replied coldly, reaching for a pair of handcuffs at his belt. Mary's heart sank as the realization hit her this was not about suspicion or doing their job, this was about power, control, and an unchecked prejudice that these officers carried with them. They had decided that she was guilty before they even spoke to her, and now they were determined to assert their authority, regardless of the truth. Isaiah stepped in front of his grandmother, his small body trembling with fear and anger. You can't take her. She didn't do anything wrong. Mary's eyes filled with tears at the sight of her grandson trying to defend her, his bravery both heart-wrenching and beautiful. She gently pulled him back, kneeling down to his level. It's okay, Isaiah, she whispered, her voice soft but steady. I need you to be brave right now. I'll be okay. Before she could say anything more, the cold metal of handcuffs clicked around her wrists. The sensation sent a shiver down her spine, and for the first time in her life, Mary Williams felt truly powerless. She glanced around, seeing the gathering crowd of onlookers, some holding their phones up to record, others murmuring in disbelief. 
As the officers led her toward their squad car, Mary held her head high. Even as her heart broke for the two small children she left standing on the sidewalk, their innocent eyes filled with confusion and fear. The squad car door slammed shut, and the sound echoed in Mary's ears like the closing of a prison gate. She sat stiffly in the back seat, her wrists aching from the tight metal cuffs. She looked through the barred windows, her eyes searching for her grandchildren who stood frozen on the sidewalk. Their small figures seemed even more fragile now, framed by the chaos of the growing crowd. A few onlookers murmured to one another, shaking their heads in disbelief as others raised their phones to record the shocking scene. Mary's heart ached. The last thing she had wanted was for Isaiah and Lily to witness something like this, something they would remember for the rest of their lives. Their innocent trust in the world was now cracked, perhaps shattered. But still, she had to remain strong for them. As she sat in the squad car, she fought to keep her mind steady, her thoughts racing to figure out what she could do to protect them, to ensure that they didn't lose faith in her or the system entirely. Across the street, Isaiah clenched his fists, his face burning with anger and helplessness. Lily, who had been trying to hold back her tears, could no longer contain them. They rolled down her cheeks in silent streams as she clung to her older brother. He put his arm around her, his little chest heaving with the effort of keeping his own emotions in check. Why did they take Grandma Lily sobbed, her voice breaking as she looked up at Isaiah for answers he didn't have. Isaiah shook his head, his jaw tightening. I don't know, Lil. I don't know. Just then, a woman from the crowd stepped forward. Her name was Miss Evelyn, an elderly neighbor who had known Mary for years. She had watched Mary raise her own children and now her grandchildren, always with grace and strength. Miss Evelyn's face was etched with concern as she approached the kids. Come here, baby, she said softly, her arms open wide. It's going to be all right. Isaiah hesitated, unsure whether to leave or stay. He felt torn between wanting to be with his grandmother and needing to protect his little sister. Eventually, he let Miss Evelyn guide them away from the scene, though he couldn't stop himself from looking back at the police car where Mary sat. He wanted to run after her, to stop the officers from taking her, but he knew that wasn't possible. His small body trembled with frustration, and though he tried to hide it, Miss Evelyn noticed. Don't you worry, Isaiah, she whispered as she walked them to her house just a few doors down. We'll figure this out. Back in the squad car, Mary stared straight ahead, refusing to let the situation break her. She knew she had to keep calm, though every nerve in her body screamed for justice. The officers sat in the front, muttering to one another as they prepared to drive away, but their words were muffled by the thick glass divider that separated them from her. Officer Travis glanced over his shoulder, his expression still hard and unreadable. We're taking you in for processing, he said coldly, as if that explained everything. For what Mary asked, her voice steady despite the rising anger she felt. I haven't done anything wrong. Dale, the older officer, scoffed and turned in his seat to face her. You were obstructing justice and resisting an officer. We gave you orders and you refused to comply. Mary felt a sharp surge of indignation. She had done nothing of the sort, and they both knew it. But these men didn't care about truth or justice. They cared about their authority, and in their eyes Mary had challenged that authority by daring to stand her ground. I asked you to explain why you were stopping me, Mary replied, her voice calm but firm. I have a right to know. And I didn't resist anything. Yeah, well that's not how we saw it, Dale said with a sneer. Mary's eyes locked onto his, and she could see the disdain lurking beneath his cool exterior. To him, she was just another person who didn't belong in their world, someone who deserved to be put in her place. The realization of that truth was painful, but it also steeled her resolve. She wasn't going to let them strip away her dignity or her rights. You can't just arrest someone because you feel like it, she said quietly. I know my rights. Officer Travis snorted. We're the law, lady. We do what needs to be done to keep the peace. Mary shook her head. Peace? You call this peace, she gestured to her handcuffed wrists the cold metal biting into her skin. You're not protecting anyone. You're only making things worse. Dale's face darkened with anger. Enough he barked, turning back to face the windshield. You'll have your chance to talk in front of a judge. With that, the car jerked forward as they began to drive away from the scene. The neighborhood faded into the distance, 
and Mary watched as the familiar houses grew smaller, replaced by the unfamiliar streets leading toward the police station. Her heart pounded in her chest, a mix of anger and fear swirling inside her, but she knew she couldn't let either one take control. She needed to stay focused. She needed to find a way out of this. As the squad car pulled up to the station, Mary's thoughts shifted to her grandchildren. She hoped Miss Evelyn would take care of them while she figured this out, but the thought of them being left in the dark wondering what had happened to their grandmother was unbearable. She needed to make sure they knew she was okay, that she was fighting for them. The officers led her inside, her hands still bound behind her back, and marched her down a cold, dimly lit hallway. The smell of stale coffee and disinfectant filled the air, and the distant hum of fluorescent lights buzzed in her ears. It felt surreal like she had been transported into a nightmare she couldn't wake up from. As they processed her paperwork and led her to a small, sterile holding cell, Mary sat on the hard bench, her mind racing. She had spent years fighting for civil rights, attending protests, writing letters, and mentoring young activists. She had always believed that progress, though slow, was possible. But now, sitting alone in a police station with her hands cuffed like a criminal, the weight of the system's injustices pressed down on her more heavily than ever before. Just as she began to lose herself in these thoughts, the door to the holding cell creaked open. A new figure entered someone Mary didn't recognize. The man was tall and slender, his suit crisply pressed, with a confident air about him. He stepped inside and closed the door behind him, looking at Mary with an intensity that made her sit up a little straighter. Mrs. Williams, he asked, his voice smooth but serious. Mary nodded, unsure of who he was or why he was there. My name is David Shaw, he continued, stepping closer and pulling a chair up to sit across from her. I'm an attorney, and I've been sent by some of your friends in the community to represent you. Relief washed over Mary, though it was tempered by the knowledge of how serious this situation had become. Thank you, she said quietly. I didn't know anyone would be able to help me so quickly. David nodded, pulling out a notepad and pen. Word travels fast, especially when it's someone as well-respected as you. I've already been briefed on the situation and I want you to know that we're going to fight this. Mary let out a slow breath, her tension easing slightly. She hadn't realized just how much she needed to hear those words until now. The charges against you are completely unjustified, David continued, his eyes narrowing. Obstruction of justice and resisting arrest. They don't have a leg to stand on, but we need to make sure we handle this carefully. The police are already on edge, and they're going to try to spin this in their favor. Mary nodded. She had seen this kind of thing happen before to others in her community. The system had a way of twisting the truth, of turning victims into criminals and justifying the actions of those in power. But this time, she wasn't going to let them win. I want to make sure my grandchildren are okay, Mary said her voice steady but full of concern. They saw the whole thing. I don't want them to be afraid. David gave her a reassuring smile. Don't worry. I've already spoken to someone who's looking after them. They're safe, and they know you'll be home soon. Mary's heart lifted at the news. Knowing Isaiah and Lily were being cared for gave her the strength she needed to continue fighting. She sat up straighter, her resolve hardening. Good, she said. Then let's get to work. Hours passed as Mary and David worked through the details of the case, preparing their defense. Outside, the situation had only grown more tense. Word of Mary's arrest had spread throughout the neighborhood and beyond, and what had begun as murmurs of disbelief had turned into an outcry for justice. Crowds began to gather outside the police station, their voices rising in chants demanding Mary's release. Signs reading justice for Mary and stop police brutality were held high as the protests grew and local media outlets arrived to cover the story. People of all ages and backgrounds had come together, united by their outrage over the treatment of someone they all respected. Inside the station, the officers took notice. Dale and Travis, who had initially dismissed the arrest as routine, began to feel the weight of the situation. They watched from a window as the crowd outside swelled, their chants growing louder and more insistent with each passing hour. What do we do now, Travis muttered, his voice betraying a hint of nervousness. Dale scowled, his jaw clenched. We do nothing, he replied firmly. She's in custody, and that's that. These people need to learn that they can't just throw a tantrum every time they don't get their way. 
Travis hesitated, glancing back at the crowd outside. Maybe we went too far with her, he said, his voice barely a whisper. Dale shot him a hard look. Are you getting soft on me, Travis? We did our job plain and simple. If they don't like it, that's their problem. But as Dale turned away, he couldn't shake the feeling that this was far from over. The crowd outside was growing by the minute, and the world was watching. And for the first time, he felt the faint stirrings of fear of fear that maybe, just maybe, he had underestimated Mary Williams. Inside the cold confines of the holding cell, Mary sat alone, her hands resting on her lap. Her mind churned with worry and anger, though she kept her composure, aware that any display of emotion could be used against her. The thought of her grandchildren, who were undoubtedly still shaken by the incident, gnawed at her heart. But Mary knew she had to keep a clear head too many people were depending on her strength. Hours had passed since her arrest, and the officers had left her in silence, perhaps hoping she would grow fearful or regretful. But Mary remained resolute, replaying the words of her lawyer, David Shaw. He had assured her that she wasn't alone, and that people outside were demanding her release. She clung to his words, finding solace in the knowledge that her community believed in her innocence. The sharp clang of metal echoed through the hallway as the door opened. Officer Dale stepped in, followed closely by Travis, their expressions guarded. Dale's face was set in a hard line, his eyes narrowed as he observed her, while Travis shifted uncomfortably, glancing down at the ground. Mary recognized that look she had seen it before in people who knew they had done something wrong but didn't have the courage to admit it. Well, Mrs. Williams, Dale said, folding his arms, it seems you have some friends who are quite vocal about your predicament. Mary looked up at him, her expression calm but resolute. Friends or not, Officer Dale, I don't deserve to be here, she replied, her voice steady, and you know it. Dale's mouth tightened, but he remained silent. Travis glanced between the two, clearly uncomfortable, before finally speaking up. Look, maybe we can work something out, Mrs. Williams. If you just admit you were uncooperative, we can make this whole thing go away. Mary's eyes narrowed. Uncooperative? I asked you to explain why you were detaining me. I wanted to understand what law I had broken. How is that uncooperative? Dale scowled, his face flushed with anger. You challenged our authority, Mrs. Williams. We don't take that lightly. Mary held his gaze, unflinching. I asked for my rights to be respected. That's not a challenge, it's a request for fairness. And if fairness feels like a challenge to you, Officer Dale, then perhaps you should reconsider your role as a law enforcement officer. Travis took a step back, his gaze averted. Dale's face twisted in anger, and for a moment Mary wondered if he might lose control. But he merely clenched his fists, his knuckles white, before storming out of the cell, leaving Travis standing awkwardly by the door. After a tense pause, Travis finally spoke, his voice softer than before. Look, Mrs. Williams, I, I'm sorry for what happened. I, I just did what I was told. Mary studied him, noting the discomfort and guilt etched into his features. She sensed that his apology was genuine, though incomplete. It's not enough to be sorry, Officer Travis, she said gently. If you know something is wrong, you have to do something about it. Travis nodded slowly, his eyes downcast. I know, I'll try. With that, he left, leaving Mary alone once more. She closed her eyes, taking a deep breath. She wasn't sure what the outcome would be, but she knew that she wouldn't back down. Her community depended on her strength, and she wouldn't let them down now. Meanwhile, outside the police station, the crowd had grown considerably. People from all walks of life had gathered, their faces a mixture of anger and determination. Some held signs reading justice for Mary and end police brutality while others chanted slogans demanding her release. The energy was palpable, and the crowd's presence served as a testament to Mary's impact on her community. David Shaw, Mary's attorney, stood near the entrance, speaking with reporters who had arrived to cover the story. He was determined to make Mary's voice heard, to ensure that the public knew the truth about her unjust treatment. He knew that the fight was far from over, but he also knew that with the community's support, they had a powerful force on their side. A reporter approached David, microphone in hand. Mr. Shaw, can you tell us what's happening inside the station? Has there been any movement toward releasing Mrs. Williams? David shook his head. Unfortunately, the officers responsible for her arrest are still refusing to drop the charges, but we're not backing down. 
Mrs. Williams has done nothing wrong, and we're prepared to fight this every step of the way. The reporter nodded, her brow furrowed in concern. And what message do you hope to send with this protest? David looked out at the crowd, his expression resolute. We want to send a message that this community won't stand for injustice. Mary Williams is a pillar of this community, a woman who has dedicated her life to helping others. We're here to show that we stand with her, that we won't tolerate this kind of abuse of power. As he spoke, the crowd erupted in applause and cheers, their voices rising in support of his words. The sense of unity and solidarity was overwhelming, and it was clear that Mary's community was willing to do whatever it took to ensure her freedom. Back inside the station, Dale and Travis were met with unexpected pressure. The station's higher-ups had taken notice of the situation, aware that the protest was growing and that the media's attention was now fixed on them. Captain Hayes, a seasoned officer with a reputation for fairness, called Dale and Travis into his office, his expression grave. Sit down, both of you, he said his tone leaving no room for argument. Dale and Travis exchanged uneasy glances before taking their seats, each one feeling the weight of the captain's scrutiny. Now explain to me why we have a respected community leader sitting in a holding cell, Captain Hayes demanded, his voice laced with irritation. I've been hearing nothing but complaints and seeing nothing but headlines, and none of it looks good. Dale shifted in his seat, his jaw clenched. Captain, we were just doing our job. She was uncooperative and refused to follow orders. Captain Hayes raised an eyebrow, his gaze sharp. Uncooperative, you say? From what I've heard, Mrs. Williams asked for an explanation as to why she was being stopped. That's hardly a reason to arrest someone. Travis looked down, visibly uncomfortable, while Dale's face turned red with anger. With all due respect, Captain, she challenged our authority. We can't have people questioning us on the streets it undermines the work we do. Captain Hayes' eyes narrowed. No, Dale, what undermines our work is abusing our authority. People like Mary Williams deserve our respect, not our suspicion. You should have handled this with more restraint. Dale opened his mouth to protest, but the captain silenced him with a stern look. Effective immediately, Mrs. Williams is to be released, and the charges against her are to be dropped. Understood. Dale's face twisted in anger, but he nodded, unable to defy the captain's orders. Travis, on the other hand, looked relieved, though he said nothing. As they left the captain's office, Dale muttered under his breath, his resentment clear. But Travis remained silent, his mind racing as he processed everything that had happened. For the first time, he questioned his role in Mary's arrest, wondering if he had allowed his loyalty to Dale to cloud his judgment. Back in the holding cell, Mary was surprised when David walked in, a smile on his face. You're being released, he said, his eyes filled with relief. Mary felt a surge of gratitude and relief wash over her. She rose from the bench, her hands still trembling slightly as she realized that she was finally free. Thank you, David. I don't know how to repay you. David shook his head. You don't need to repay me, Mary. This is about justice. You should never have been here in the first place. As they left the station, Mary was met with the sight of the crowd outside, their cheers and applause filling the air as they saw her step out of the building. Tears sprang to her eyes as she took in the sight of her community, her friends, her neighbors, and even strangers who had come to support her. Isaiah and Lily were at the front of the crowd, their faces lighting up as they spotted their grandmother. They ran to her, throwing their arms around her as she knelt down to embrace them, her heart overflowing with love and relief. We knew you'd come back, Grandma Isaiah whispered, his voice choked with emotion. Mary hugged them tightly, feeling the strength and resilience of her community in that moment. She knew that the road ahead wouldn't be easy, but she also knew that she wasn't alone. As the crowd continued to cheer, David took the opportunity to address them, his voice carrying a message of hope and unity. Today we showed that we won't be silenced, that we won't stand for injustice. Mary Williams is a symbol of strength and resilience, and we're here to make sure that her voice and the voices of others like her are heard. The crowd erupted in applause once more, their unity stronger than ever. And as Mary looked out at the sea of faces, she knew that her fight for justice was just beginning. As Mary and her grandchildren returned home, a renewed sense of purpose filled the air around them. The injustice she had faced wasn't just a personal slight, it was a spark that ignited something far greater. 
The whispers of anger from the community were now a resounding chorus, echoing a collective call for change. People from every corner of the neighborhood felt her story as if it were their own, and it stirred long-held frustrations with a system that had often ignored or oppressed them. That evening, Mary sat by her living room window watching as neighbors, friends, and even strangers gathered outside her home. The flickering glow of candles lit up the faces of those who had come to show their support. Some held signs demanding justice. Others shared whispered stories of their own experiences with prejudice and inequality. Mary could feel the weight of their hope and determination, each person standing as a testament to the resilience of the community she loved. Isaiah and Lily sat beside her, their eyes wide with wonder as they watched the crowd grow. Grandma, why are all these people here? Isaiah asked, his young face filled with a mixture of curiosity and awe. Mary put a gentle hand on his shoulder, her eyes filled with pride. They're here because they believe in standing up for what's right, Isaiah, she replied. Sometimes when we face hard things, it reminds people that we all deserve to be treated with respect and kindness. Lily nodded, her small hand clutching Mary's tightly. Are they going to help you, Grandma? Mary smiled softly, her heart warmed by the innocence in her granddaughter's question. Yes, sweetie. And I'm going to help them, too. We're all in this together. The next morning, Mary was greeted by a knock at her door. She opened it to find David Shaw, her attorney, standing on the porch with a determined look on his face. Behind him were several community leaders, friends, and allies who had come to discuss the next steps in their fight for justice. Mary David began, his tone serious but warm. There's a lot of work to be done, but we believe that your story can be a powerful tool for change. The community is behind you, and together we have a chance to make sure what happened to you doesn't happen to anyone else. Mary nodded, the weight of the moment sinking in. She had always been a private person, preferring to lead quietly and avoid the spotlight. But she knew that staying silent now would mean allowing others to suffer the same injustice. She took a deep breath feeling a swell of courage within her. What do we need to do, she asked, her voice steady. David exchanged glances with the others before speaking. We're organizing a rally to raise awareness about police accountability and racial injustice. We'll be bringing in civil rights advocates, local politicians, and members of the media. But more than anything, we need your voice, Mary. You're the one who can show the world what's at stake here. Mary felt a flicker of hesitation, but it was quickly overshadowed by her resolve. She had spent her life teaching her children and grandchildren the importance of standing up for what's right, and now it was her turn to lead by example. I'll do it, she said firmly, her eyes meeting David's. I'll do whatever it takes to make a difference. David smiled, relief evident on his face. Thank you, Mary. This means a lot to everyone. In the days leading up to the rally, the community mobilized with an intensity and unity that was both inspiring and powerful. Flyers were posted on every corner, social media campaigns gained momentum, and volunteers worked tirelessly to spread the word. People from neighboring communities joined in, their voices adding to the chorus of those calling for change. Mary spent hours preparing her speech, reflecting on the lessons she wanted to share and the strength she hoped to inspire in others. She knew this was more than just her story, it was a chance to address a system that had marginalized so many. Late one evening, as she sat at her kitchen table surrounded by notes and drafts, Isaiah and Lily wandered in, their sleepy eyes blinking in the soft glow of the kitchen light. Grandma, are you still working? Isaiah asked, rubbing his eyes as he climbed into her lap. Mary smiled, wrapping her arms around him. Yes, baby, I have something very important to say and I want to make sure I get it just right. Lily yawned, resting her head on Mary's shoulder. Can we help? Mary chuckled, feeling a warmth fill her heart. Of course you can. You're helping just by being here with me. Together, they spent the rest of the night brainstorming and sharing ideas, the children's innocent perspectives reminding Mary of the simple truths that sometimes got lost in the complexity of adult struggles. By the time the sun rose, she felt more prepared than ever, her message clear and powerful. The day of the rally arrived and the streets around Mary's neighborhood were packed with people from all walks of life. Banners and signs waved in the air, each one carrying a message of hope, justice, and unity. A stage had been set up in the center of the park, and a microphone stood waiting for Mary, who would be the final speaker of the day. David stood by her side, offering words of encouragement as they waited for her turn to speak. 
You've got this, Mary, he said with a reassuring smile. Just speak from the heart. Mary nodded, taking a steadying breath as she looked out at the sea of faces before her. Among them she saw friends, neighbors, and countless others who had come to stand in solidarity. Her heart swelled with gratitude and pride, knowing that they had all gathered to support a cause greater than any one person. One by one, speakers took the stage, each sharing stories of resilience and determination. Civil rights leaders, community activists, and even local politicians spoke of the need for reform and the importance of holding those in power accountable. The crowd listened intently, their voices rising in applause and cheers at every call for justice. Finally, it was Mary's turn. As she stepped up to the microphone, a hush fell over the crowd, their anticipation palpable. She took a moment to collect herself, feeling the weight of their hopes resting on her shoulders. Thank you all for being here today, she began, her voice carrying across the park. Thank you for standing with me, for standing with each other. We're here because we believe in a world where everyone is treated with respect and dignity, regardless of who they are or where they come from. The crowd murmured in agreement, their eyes fixed on Mary as she continued. I've spent my life in this community, raising my children and grandchildren, working to make a difference in my own quiet way. But sometimes, life has a way of reminding us that there are battles we can't fight alone. And that's why we're here today not just for me, but for every person who has faced injustice, for every child who deserves to grow up in a world where they feel safe and valued. Mary paused, glancing at Isaiah and Lily, who stood in the front row with wide, admiring eyes. Her voice softened as she spoke of the incident that had brought them all together. A few days ago, I was treated unfairly by the very people who are supposed to protect us. I was made to feel powerless simply because I dared to ask for my rights. But I am not powerless, and neither are you. The crowd erupted into applause, their voices rising in a unified show of support. Mary felt a surge of strength, her words flowing with a newfound confidence. We have a choice, she continued, her voice growing stronger. We can choose to be silent, to accept things as they are. Or we can stand up, speak out, and demand a better future. Today, we choose to fight. Not with anger or hatred, but with hope and love. Because that's the only way we'll create a world worth living in. As Mary finished her speech, the crowd broke into a thunderous applause, their cheers filling the air. Isaiah and Lily rushed forward, throwing their arms around her in a tight embrace, their faces beaming with pride. The rally continued long into the evening, with people sharing stories, singing songs, and vowing to continue the fight for justice. Mary knew that the road ahead would be challenging, but as she looked out at the faces of her community, she felt a deep sense of hope. She had ignited a spark, and now it was up to them to keep the fire burning. The morning after the rally, Mary felt a renewed sense of purpose. The unity and strength of the community had filled her with a fierce determination. For too long, she had witnessed injustices going unchecked, people too afraid or too disheartened to speak up. But this time was different. This time she wouldn't be silent, and neither would her community. As she sat at her kitchen table, sipping her coffee, her phone rang. It was David Shaw, her attorney and now one of her closest allies in the fight for justice. Mary, I have some news, he began, his tone serious but optimistic. We filed formal complaints against officers Dale and Travis, and we're pushing for a full investigation into their conduct. Given the evidence we have, including video footage from the arrest, I believe we have a solid case. Mary felt a surge of relief mixed with anxiety. Do you really think this will work, David? That they'll be held accountable? David's voice softened. I know it's not easy to trust the system, especially after everything you've been through. But with the support of the community and the media attention this has garnered, we have a real chance to make a difference. I've already spoken to the district attorney, and they're taking the case seriously. Mary took a deep breath, her heart steadying with each word. Thank you, David. I don't know what I'd do without you. We're in this together, Mary. Now, let's get to work. Over the following weeks, Mary and David worked tirelessly to build their case. The process was grueling with numerous meetings, court filings, and interviews. The media's interest remained strong, and reporters frequently reached out to Mary, eager to capture her perspective and share her story with a broader audience. One afternoon, 
As she and David sat in his office reviewing documents, David looked up, a thoughtful expression on his face. Mary, there's something I need to prepare you for. The defense team representing officers Dale and Travis will likely try to discredit you. They'll use every tactic they can to paint you in a negative light, hoping to weaken your credibility. Mary nodded, her eyes steely with resolve. I understand, David. I've lived long enough to know that the truth isn't always enough. But I also know that I won't let them intimidate me. David smiled, admiration shining in his eyes. That's the spirit, Mary. Remember, you have the truth on your side, and you have a community that believes in you. They're counting on you to stand strong, and I know you won't let them down. Mary felt a renewed sense of purpose, her determination strengthening with each passing day. She knew that this battle wasn't just for herself, it was for Isaiah, Lily, and every person who had ever been treated unjustly. When the day of the trial arrived, the courtroom was packed. Friends, family, and community members filled the seats, their faces a mixture of anticipation and support. Mary sat beside David, her hands folded neatly in her lap, her posture calm and composed. She felt the weight of the eyes on her, but instead of fear, she felt a deep sense of pride. Across the room, officers Dale and Travis sat with their defense team, their expressions guarded. Dale's jaw was clenched, his face a mask of defiance, while Travis appeared uncomfortable, shifting in his seat as he avoided Mary's gaze. The judge entered, calling the court to order, and the trial began. The prosecution laid out the evidence clearly and methodically, presenting video footage of the arrest and testimonies from witnesses who had been present. The jury watched attentively, their faces growing solemn as they witnessed the cold, unjust treatment Mary had endured. One by one, witnesses came forward to share their experiences with the police officers. Some recounted their own encounters, describing instances of bias and prejudice, while others spoke of Mary's role in the community, painting a picture of a woman whose kindness and strength had touched countless lives. Each testimony added weight to the case, strengthening the prosecution's argument that Mary's arrest had been an abuse of power. When it was Mary's turn to testify, she took the stand with quiet dignity. She recounted the events leading up to her arrest, her voice steady and clear as she described the officer's harsh treatment and her refusal to back down in the face of injustice. The jury listened intently, their eyes fixed on her as she shared her story. I've spent my life teaching my children and grandchildren to respect others to stand up for what's right, and to never let fear control them, she said, her voice filled with conviction. That day I wasn't just standing up for myself, I was standing up for everyone who deserves to be treated with respect and fairness. No one should have to feel powerless simply because of the color of their skin. The courtroom was silent, her words resonating deeply with everyone present. David watched her with pride, knowing that her testimony was the heart of their case. Mary's courage and resilience were undeniable, and he was confident that the jury saw it too. The defense attempted to counter with arguments that Mary had been uncooperative and disruptive painting a picture of a woman who had refused to comply with lawful orders. But the evidence was clear, and each attempt to discredit her fell flat. Video footage showed her calm demeanor, her reasonable questions, and her unwavering composure in the face of unwarranted hostility. Officer Travis was called to testify and as he took the stand he avoided Mary's gaze. His face was pale, his expression tense as he answered the prosecutor's questions. Officer Travis the prosecutor began, Can you explain why you and Officer Dale chose to stop Mrs. Williams that day? Travis hesitated, his gaze flickering toward Dale before he spoke. We, we received reports of suspicious activity in the area, and Mrs. Williams matched the description we were given. The prosecutor raised an eyebrow, clearly skeptical. And what exactly was suspicious about a grandmother walking home from the grocery store with her grandchildren? Travis shifted uncomfortably, his face growing flushed. It wasn't just, it was the situation. We felt it was necessary to question her, to make sure everything was in order. The prosecutor leaned forward, his voice sharp. Did Mrs. Williams ever give you any reason to believe she was a threat? Travis's hesitation spoke volumes, and the silence in the courtroom grew heavy. No, he admitted finally his voice barely a whisper. She, she was calm and cooperative. She didn't resist. The prosecutor pressed further. So, would you say that Mrs. Williams was arrested without just cause? Travis swallowed, his face flushed with guilt. 
Yes, he whispered, his eyes downcast. I believe so. A murmur rippled through the courtroom as his admission hung in the air. The defense attorneys scrambled to regain control, but the damage had been done. Travis's words had exposed the truth, shattering any illusion that Mary's arrest had been justified. As the trial drew to a close, the prosecution delivered a powerful closing statement, emphasizing the importance of accountability and justice. They urged the jury to consider not only Mary's personal ordeal but also the broader implications of unchecked authority and discrimination. When it was time for the jury to deliberate, Mary sat quietly, her hands clasped tightly as she waited for the verdict. She felt a mixture of nerves and hope, her heart pounding as she thought of Isaiah and Lily, who were waiting at home with Miss Evelyn. After what felt like an eternity, the jury returned, their expressions solemn as they filed back into the courtroom. The judge asked for the verdict, and the foreperson stood, holding a piece of paper. We find the defendants, officers Dale and Travis, guilty of misconduct and abuse of authority, she announced, her voice clear and unwavering. We recommend disciplinary action, including suspension and mandatory training in racial sensitivity and de-escalation techniques. Relief washed over Mary, and she closed her eyes, a wave of gratitude flooding through her. She had won not just for herself but for everyone who had ever faced injustice. The verdict was a victory, a step toward accountability and change. As the courtroom emptied, friends and supporters gathered around Mary, their faces filled with joy and pride. David placed a comforting hand on her shoulder, his smile warm and genuine. You did it, Mary. You stood up for what was right, and you made a difference. Mary smiled, her eyes shining with tears. We all did this, David. This was never just about me. In the weeks that followed, the impact of Mary's case reverberated throughout the community and beyond. The police department implemented new training programs, focusing on racial sensitivity and fair treatment, and officers were held to higher standards of accountability. Mary's case became a catalyst for change, inspiring others to speak out and demand justice. The community organized regular meetings, creating a forum for open dialogue between law enforcement and residents. Mary was often invited to speak, her wisdom and experience guiding the discussions as she encouraged others to find their voices. One evening, as she sat on her porch with Isaiah and Lily, watching the sun set over the neighborhood, she felt a deep sense of peace. The journey had been long and difficult, but she had emerged stronger, her faith in the power of community reaffirmed. Grandma Isaiah said, his voice soft as he looked up at her, I'm really proud of you. Mary smiled, pulling him close. Thank you, Isaiah. With her case behind her and a victorious outcome for the community, Mary Williams felt a renewed energy in her life. Her quiet resilience and dignity had inspired change that resonated far beyond her neighborhood. Her story became a symbol, a spark for others who had suffered silently to find their own voices. As the weeks turned to months, the ripple effects of her victory continued to spread. Mary's neighborhood was buzzing with a newfound sense of pride. Residents gathered regularly in the local community center, now a vibrant hub for open discussions on policing, community safety, and mutual respect. Officers from the local precinct attended these meetings, genuinely listening to the stories and concerns of the community members. The divide that once existed between the residents and the authorities was slowly being bridged through honest dialogue and accountability. One afternoon, Mary was invited to speak at the annual city council meeting. She wore a simple yet elegant navy blue dress, her silver hair pulled back in a neat bun. Her appearance was a stark contrast to the young activists and passionate speakers who had rallied behind her cause, but her presence commanded respect. Her lined face was calm yet resolute, a testament to the battle she had fought and the strength she had gained. Isaiah and Lily, now inseparable from their grandmother at community events, sat proudly in the front row. They had seen their grandmother endure more than a child should ever have to witness but they had also seen her emerge victorious. Mary's story was now a part of their own, a legacy of courage and determination that they would carry with them for the rest of their lives. As Mary spoke to the council members, her voice steady and clear, she urged them to remember the humanity at the heart of every law, every policy, and every decision they made. Her words carried weight, not just because of her story, but because she embodied the spirit of the community, a spirit that refused to be silenced or ignored. I'm here today not as a victim, but as a reminder, Mary said, her eyes sweeping over the council members and the audience. 
a reminder that every person you serve has a story, a life, a family that depends on them. We're not numbers on a page or faces in a crowd. We're your neighbors, your friends, your community. That evening, as she returned home with Isaiah and Lily by her side, Mary felt a sense of fulfillment she hadn't experienced in years. The three of them sat together on the front steps of their house, watching the stars appear one by one in the darkening sky. The air was filled with the scent of jasmine from a nearby garden, a soothing reminder of life's small, simple pleasures. Grandma Isaiah said softly, breaking the comfortable silence, Do you think things will really change? Mary looked down at him, her hand resting gently on his shoulder. Change takes time, Isaiah, but as long as there are people willing to stand up for what's right, there's always hope. Lily leaned against her, her head resting on Mary's shoulder. You're the bravest person I know, Grandma, she whispered, her voice full of awe. Mary chuckled softly, wrapping her arms around her grandchildren. Bravery isn't about being unafraid, my loves. It's about doing what's right, even when you are afraid. The three of them sat in peaceful silence, a quiet contentment settling over them. The battles they had faced had left their marks, but they had also brought them closer together, strengthening the bond they shared. As the months passed, Mary continued to be an active presence in her community. She became a mentor to young activists, guiding them with wisdom and patience. She shared her knowledge with them, helping them navigate the challenges of activism with grace and resilience. Her influence extended to the local police department as well. After months of discussions and efforts, a partnership program was established between the community and the precinct. Officers were assigned as liaisons working directly with community members to foster trust and cooperation. Mary served as a consultant, her insights and experiences shaping the training programs and policies that would govern their interactions. The changes weren't instant, and they weren't always easy. There were moments of tension, setbacks, and challenges that threatened to undo their progress. But Mary's determination never wavered, and her community rallied around her, their commitment unwavering. One evening, at a community event celebrating the progress they had made, Mary stood on the stage, her grandchildren at her side. She looked out at the crowd, her heart swelling with pride and gratitude. The faces before her were a tapestry of resilience and unity, a testament to the strength that came from standing together. Isaiah and Lily held her hands as she spoke, their young faces beaming with pride. Today we celebrate not just the changes we've achieved, but the spirit of this community, she said, her voice ringing out across the gathering. This isn't the end of our journey, it's just the beginning. Together we've shown that change is possible, and together we'll continue to work for a future that's fair and just for everyone. The crowd erupted in applause, their cheers echoing through the night. As Mary looked down at her grandchildren, she knew that they were the true legacy of her journey. They had witnessed her struggles, her resilience, and her victory. They had learned the value of courage and compassion, and they would carry those lessons with them as they grew. That night, as the community celebrated, Mary felt a profound sense of peace. She had faced the storm, emerged stronger, and left a lasting impact on the world around her. Her story had become a beacon of hope, a testament to the power of one voice joined by many. As the evening drew to a close, Isaiah and Lily leaned against her their faces lit with contentment and pride. They were her legacy, her hope, and her reason for fighting. And in their smiles, she saw the future a future that, thanks to the strength of her community, would be a little brighter, a little fairer, and a lot more just. In the days following her release, Mary Williams became more than just a respected elder in her community. She became a symbol of resilience and the power of peaceful resistance against injustice. Her case had sparked widespread outrage, with her community rallying to support her, and it caught the attention of local media, who broadcasted the story of her wrongful arrest. Her experience didn't only spotlight the systemic issues of bias and prejudice within law enforcement, but it also highlighted the strength that a united community can wield in the face of those challenges. Mary's first steps outside the police station were met with a crowd of supporters who cheered her resilience and celebrated her release. Among them were her grandchildren Isaiah and Lily, who had stood by her side throughout the ordeal, learning powerful lessons about courage and integrity. Mary knelt down to embrace them, her heart swelling with gratitude for the people who had stood by her. She realized that she wasn't only fighting for her rights, she was fighting for her family's future and for every person in the community who had been treated unjustly. 
With her attorney David Shaw at her side, Mary decided to press forward with a formal complaint against officers Dale and Travis, holding them accountable for their misuse of authority. David, a devoted advocate for civil rights, filed a legal claim, citing unlawful arrest and discriminatory conduct. The case took on a life of its own, attracting the support of civil rights organizations, local activists, and even government officials. Public pressure mounted on the police department to address the broader issues that Mary's case had illuminated, and discussions around police reform took center stage in city council meetings and public forums. The legal proceedings were challenging and, at times, emotionally draining for Mary. Each day in court tested her patience, as the defense team for officers Dale and Travis tried to paint her as uncooperative and defiant. Yet Mary's character, combined with the testimonies of eyewitnesses and the clear video evidence of her calm demeanor during the arrest, proved otherwise. Her attorney David argued skillfully, pointing out the officers' blatant abuse of power and the discriminatory nature of their actions. The courtroom was often filled with community members who came to watch the proceedings, their presence a powerful reminder of the support Mary had behind her. As the trial progressed, Officer Travis, who had initially gone along with Dale's lead, took the stand and, in a moment of rare honesty, admitted that he had acted out of misplaced loyalty and fear of challenging his superior. His admission lent significant weight to Mary's case and underscored the need for accountability within the police force. Officer Dale, however, remained unrepentant, his stern expression unyielding as he defended his actions, maintaining that he was just doing his job. But his words fell flat against the wave of public sentiment and mounting evidence that he had, in fact, acted out of bias. In the end, the jury found both officers guilty of misconduct and abuse of authority, recommending disciplinary actions that included suspension and mandatory retraining on racial sensitivity and de-escalation techniques. For Mary, the verdict was a victory not only for herself but for her community and everyone who had faced similar injustices. It sent a powerful message that no one, regardless of their position, was above accountability. Mary had not only cleared her name but had set a precedent that encouraged others to stand up for their rights and speak out against discrimination. The outcome of Mary's case led to tangible changes in her city's law enforcement practices. With her community's support, she worked closely with local leaders to implement programs that focused on building trust between police officers and the people they served. She became a key figure in community police forums, offering her perspective and helping to bridge the divide that had long existed. Training programs were developed to educate officers on cultural sensitivity and non-violent conflict resolution, marking a significant step toward reform. In the months following the trial, Mary's story inspired others to come forward with their own experiences of injustice, creating a ripple effect of awareness and empowerment. Community members organized regular gatherings to discuss issues of fairness, safety, and equality, inviting local law enforcement to listen and participate. These gatherings, once filled with frustration and distrust, gradually transformed into spaces of open dialogue and shared understanding. Mary's influence extended to these gatherings, where her calm wisdom helped guide the conversations toward productive, lasting change. One day, Mary was invited to speak at a city-wide event commemorating her victory and the progress that had followed. She stood on a small stage flanked by Isaiah and Lily, each of them holding her hand. She looked out at the crowd, her heart full as she saw familiar faces friends, neighbors and supporters who had stood by her. She took a deep breath and spoke with a warmth that resonated with everyone listening. We are here today because we believe in a better future, she said, her voice strong and steady. This journey wasn't easy, but it showed us what we're capable of when we come together. Change isn't something that happens overnight, and it doesn't come from anger or resentment. It comes from love, from a commitment to justice, and from the courage to stand up for what's right. The crowd erupted in applause, their voices joining together in a moment of unity. Isaiah and Lily looked up at their grandmother with pride, having witnessed her courage firsthand. They knew that the legacy she was building would be one that carried forward, inspiring others to act with integrity and compassion. As the evening wore on, people lingered in the park, sharing stories and celebrating the community's accomplishments. Mary stood among them, quietly watching as her neighbors and friends laughed and embraced, their faces lit by the warm glow of string lights that hung above the crowd. She felt a sense of fulfillment that went beyond words she had not only stood up for herself but had also paved the way for others to live with dignity and respect. Looking out over the gathering, Mary realized that she had helped plant seeds of change that would continue to grow long after she was gone. 
Her journey had taught her that justice and compassion weren't abstract ideals, they were values that lived in the hearts of everyday people, values that could bring people together and create a lasting impact. In the months and years that followed, Mary continued to work with young activists, guiding them with her wisdom and experience. She taught them the importance of resilience, of choosing kindness over anger, and of never giving up hope, even when the road seemed impossible. Isaiah and Lily, inspired by their grandmother's example, grew up with a profound sense of justice, determined to carry her legacy forward. Mary's story became a cherished memory in the community, a testament to the power of one voice, amplified by many, to challenge injustice and inspire change. Her life became a symbol of strength, unity, and hope, a reminder that even in the face of adversity, ordinary people could make an extraordinary difference. And as the years went on, the impact of Mary Williams' courage continued to echo through the lives of those she had touched, a beacon of hope for generations to come.